So we talked about the sympathetic nervous system, and now we are going to talk about the parasympathetic nervous system and sort of bring it all together and compare the two. So the parasympathetic nervous system, so we said the sympathetic nervous system was the fight or flight. You can think of the parasympathetic nervous system as the rest and digest, or rest, digest, and procreate system. So um, parasympathetic nervous system uses a two neuron pathway from the spinal cord to the effector organs. Um, the, we talked about the sympathetic nervous system, the preganglionic cells come between um, T1 and L2, and the sympathetic um, postganglionic um, neurons, the sympathetic ganglions are right close to the spinal cord. With the parasympathetic nervous system, the preganglionic cell bodies are found in the nuclei of the brain stem and the sacral spinal cord, so sort of surrounding the um, sympathetic. And so a lot of times they call it cranial sacral outflow because it's going from the cranium and from the sacrum and it's going out to the effector organs. The ganglia of the parasympath uh, parasympathetic nervous system are separate. They're not like the interconnected ganglia of the sympathetic trunk. The parasympathetic ganglia are located near or even in the target organs. So with the sympathetic nervous system, they're all interconnected. They all activate together. They're very close to um, the preganglionic neuron, and so it's quick. The parasympathetic ganglia, they are not interconnected. They're far apart, and they're, locate, they're located near or in the target organs, and so the um, activation of the parasympathetic system happens more slowly than the sympathetic. That's a nice comparison to remember. The principal functions of the parasympathetic nervous system are energy conservation and storage. So efferent fibers in the vagus nerve innervate the heart and smooth muscle of the lungs and digestive system. The vagus nerve is cranial nerve 10. Um, the sacral parasympathetic efferents regulate the emptying of bowel and bladder and the erection of the penis or clitoris. So specific autonomic reflexes are, um, we're going to discuss them more when we talk about those various regions of the nervous system. So when we talk about the spinal region, we'll talk more about um, autonomic dysreflexia and um, some of the functions that you'll see with spinal cord injuries. Um, and when we talk about cranial nerves, we'll talk about more of the effects of the vagus nerve. The... Um, Effects of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system are synergistic. Their opposing actions are balanced to provide optimal organ function. So um, the autonomic efferent systems have separate unopposed effects, but the role of the parasympath um, parasympathetic system in increasing the convexity of the lens is also unopposed. So um, there are some of the effects, and you'll see that in the, um, in the chapter, some of the effects are opposed, you know, the uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic have the opposite effect, and some of them are unopposed. It just, um, either it's happening or it's not. Um, so the, the first example in Table 9.2 is um, having to do with the eye, um, the diameter um, of the pupil, the sympathetic effect is to increase the diameter of the pupil. The parasympathetic effect is to decrease the diameter of the pupil, so that it's an opposed effect. Um, the curvature of the lens, there is no sympathetic effect, but the parasympathetic effect is to increase the curvature of the lens. So that's the, an example of an unopposed effect. So you can tell in that um, chart, the up arrows or the down arrows, um, whether it's an opposed action or an unopposed action. So this is um, some comparison of sympathetic and parasympathetic functions, and this is the chart from page 182. So um, the, a lot of them have to do with vital function, whether you're um, dilating airways or constricting um, veins and in skeletal muscle or constricting um, 
vascular smooth muscle, that sort of thing, but you can just sort of compare those two. But what I really want you to know is um, what, it, what it's going to look like when somebody's having a sympathetic effect versus a parasympathetic effect. So if you had a patient who um, was sweating and their eyes were dilated and um, their heart rate was up, they prob those are sympathetic effects, so they're probably having some sympathetic activation. So do you think that person is likely agitated? Very likely. Um, if you had someone who um, their, the diameter of their pupil was uh, more constricted and they, um, they were, uh, maybe their stomach was growling like they're hungry and they're, um, they said, boy, I really have to go to the bathroom. Um, they're in a parasympathetic um, state, so they um, are probably less agitated. It's a good way to think of it. If somebody is um, in a, having a sympathetic response, it's going to take them a while to calm down from that, if that makes any sense. So um, the part in the book where they talk about clinical correlations there are lots of different um, autonomic effects depending on the um, area of the nervous system that's affected. So if a peripheral nerve is severed, um, you get interruption of sympathetic um, efferents and you get loss of vascular control and temperature regulation and sweating. So if you have a severed nerve, you might have um, altered circulation, so the skin color might be different. You might have altered sweating. That um, limb might be cold. Um, so that is a way to tell that you have an um, interruption of sympathetic efferents in the peripheral region. Um, in the spinal region, um, complete spinal cord lesions, not only do they interrupt um, all of the motor and sensory pathways, they also interrupt autonomic pathways. So a complete spinal cord lesion interrupts all communication between the um, cord below the lesion and the brain. So complete lesions above the mid-thoracic level isolate much of the cord from control by the brain. So you get a different, um, a lot of people who with spinal cord injuries um, above mid-thoracic level, they don't sweat normally, so they have a difficulty with temperature regulation. Um, there are um, lots of different things, and we'll talk about this more in the spinal region chapter, but there are lots of autonomic effects from the spinal region. It also affects bowel and bladder issues. Um, in the brainstem region, if you have a lesion, um, that can interfere with descending control of heart rate, blood pressure, and respiration. Um, serious, serious. The, this could be a life-threatening lesion. In the cerebral region, um, it can... Uh, affect obesity, anorexia, which we know is just loss of appetite, hyperthermia, um, hypothermia, and emotional displays. Because remember we talked about how um, it, the hypothalamus and the limbic system, the emotional system, are all tied into the autonomic system. Um, orthostatic hypotension that we talked about a little bit, it's a decrease of at least 20 millimeters of mercury in the systolic blood pressure or 10 millimeters of mercury in the diastolic um, blood pressure immediately upon standing or during the first three minutes of standing. So um, that is something that you are definitely going to monitor in your patients. And a lot of times people will stand up and they'll say, wow, I feel dizzy. Okay, well, <laughs> that's an issue. <laughs> it's an issue for balance and everything. And so you might monitor someone's blood pressure in seated and then in standing. And if they have a drop of um, 20 millimeters of mercury in the systolic blood pressure or 10 in the diastolic, um, well, sit them down <laughs> and, um, and you know work on the issues or stand up a little more slowly next time. So it's definitely something to be aware of. And we will talk more of it about orthostatic hypotension when we talk about other systems. So um, there's three types. Orthostatic hypotension can cause syncope, which is fainting. Um, and there are basically three types. Um, neural reflexive, orthostatic, and cardiac. So neural reflexive is generally caused by a vagal, uh, vasovagal reaction where the vagus nerve is involved. Um, orthostatic is what we just talked about. And cardiac um, is uh, 
the causes of syncope include arrhythmias and structural diseases. So um, lots of different things can cause syncope. It's not always orthostatic hypotension, but it can be.